Yeah, it works on all the screens. Right, so that's what we know. They wouldn't be able to see it, but then now I can hear. It says now I can hear. They can hear now. Okay, so here is your second test question. Okay, there I am on my 80th birthday. I always ride on my birthday. And when I lived in Michigan, if I rode on my birthday, I sometimes resorted to putting on my snowmobile suit, getting on the horse. She still had a blanket on. I'd ride around the corral and say, okay, I've done it. <laughs> but this year, because it was a you know, big birthday, we went to Guadalupe. And so my son took me riding on my 80th birthday. But let's look at these horses. Which horse is happier, the one on the left or the one on the right? <laughs> Left, left, yes. Left and that horse had her ears the back the entire time, except when we were riding along the trail and some people were walking uh, ahead of us, and suddenly her ears went up. And I wondered, is she, you know, missing her owner or something that she is doing this? I mean, this was a riding stable where you pay up the um, euros in this case to ride for a couple of hours. Um, so I'm pretty sure that horse was in pain. And if you take home nothing from this evening, uh, it is that many of our horse behavior problems are rooted in pain. So if we can alleviate their pain, they will be much better. Uh, animals for us. And finally, before I turn over to Dr. Anderson, we have a group in France who feels that they can tell when a horse is depressed and they can tell that by the fact that its um, head is down and it's straight so that the happier horse, if he's just resting, will have um, his neck curved, as you can see on the right. Um, and if the horse is interested in the surroundings, his head is up and his ears are up. But this horse has ears to the side and it's uh, back and withers higher than they should be, given that he isn't um, flexing his neck. So this is what they call a withdrawn horse. So take a look at the horses in your care and see if any of them show this posture. Okay, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Anderson, who is a resident, but she also does emergency work. She's been a uh, cattle practitioner. So she speaks many languages. Uh, so. She'll be able to hit escape, and then it will be on the desktop. This is our the first other open one. <laughs> Okay, can you guys see that? Okay, and I have to talk to the microphone, right? Oh, uh, there's microphones all around. So oh, okay, can everyone hear me? Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, so um, this is a topic I think that a lot of people um, are interested in. We had a couple people complete history forms for tonight, and it was a requested topic. How many people here have had an issue with their horse accepting? injections or handling definitely a couple of people um i was a large animal vet for many years and so it's something that i struggled with because um i had to vaccinate a large number of horses every spring and you're always busy and you want to get it done and move on to your next call um and so it was something that really interested me in trying to find a way to not have to go through all that difficulty um and it's frustrating because it's not that difficult to fix, but it takes time and it takes some forethought. And so we'll talk a little bit about how to go into that. Um, I don't expect to solve it for all of you in 20 minutes, but I think if you take anything away, it's what Dr. Haup was talking about is to watch your horse's body language, watch their behavior, and think about how they're reacting to the situation or if what you're doing is making your horse more relaxed or more tense. Um, certainly it's no fun when, when you want to get something done and you're the vet and, and the horse doesn't want you to be there. Let's see. And as the owner, you're so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just push the button? Oh, there we go. 
Um, I just want to mention two people that I think contribute a lot to animal behavior. Sue McDonald is a animal behaviorist at UPenn. She does a lot of work looking at pain in horses. Um, she does a lot of work with reproductive behavior. Um, I took a fabulous course with her last fall where we did a lot of this stuff in practice, which was really helpful. Um, and then Susan Friedman is an animal behaviorist that works with a variety of species. She also, I borrowed a lot of her pictures because she has a lot of great resources. Um, so this is from Susan Friedman. I think this is the one that's the biggest challenge. It's sort of that mental hur hurdle for us as people because we're so involved with our horses and our animals. Um, we think we know what they're thinking all the time and we think that they are spiteful or they have a certain motivation for what they're doing. They know better, they should know they shouldn't do this. I'm not judging you guys, I think we all do that. It's just a human characteristic of, of sort of jumping to a label. That horse is a jerk or he's, he's such a mean horse. Um, what an animal does is not what it is. So an animal is just doing a behavior that works for them. They might be in pain um, and, or they might just have a very conditioned fear response to the vet. They know what that means. They don't enjoy that experience and they learn over time that if they don't cooperate, that it's, it gets them what they want. They don't have to deal with that procedure. Um, so I think that's one of the first steps you can have is because I think it sets up a confrontation in our mind. It's a barrier to trying to fix the problem because we're so determined to think they, they should know better. They should want to do this for us. Why are they being so difficult? Certainly labeling things, especially when you're trying to figure out how to solve it is helpful. It just shouldn't be our first course of action to, you know, we might label a horse as aggressive in order to try to fix the problem, but it does sort of set up this us versus them mentality, which I think is dangerous a lot of the time. So I'm not going to bore you too much with learning theory. Um, so I just put cartoons to make it more exciting. But I think it's important to understand a couple of these things because I think a lot of this terminology is used in sort of um, common online on the internet. A lot of people talk about different kinds of conditioning or learning and they use these terms incorrectly. So I just want to quickly kind of talk about what these mean. So, Learning happens with animals and people either through like a condition response, classical conditioning. So that's where you pay, that's like Pavlov's dodge. You pair a stimulus um, with an unconditioned stimulus. So the ringing bell and the food and the, the dog salivates. And over time they salivate at the sound of the bell. So a really good example in people is a mother who's nursing. She hears her baby cry, she, her milk lets down. So it's not something that you, uh, uh, an individual has to learn. It's just conditioned and it's a, innate response that we have, a physiologic response. Um, we can't help salivating if we're smelling something hungry. You know, there's lots of things like that. Um, and then there's the lab rat who will, you know, press lever for food. That's basically operant conditioning. So that's where an animal or a person acts on their environment and there's a response and then they learn over time that if I do this, this happens. That's what we use a lot when we're working with horses and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So just trying to keep it simple, um, when we talk about, a lot of people talk about positive and negative reinforcement. So I just wanna go into that a little bit. Basically all we're looking to do is increase or decrease behavior. Um, if you reward a behavior you want, you add a good thing, then you're gonna increase that behavior. If you take away a bad thing, like pressure on a horse, you're gonna increase that behavior. So ne that's negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement. We use that a lot with horses and a lot of times people think of negative as bad and positive as good and that, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means giving and taking. If you ignore a behavior you don't want, um, that behavior is going to decrease. So a horse that's tied in, in, in um, cross ties, that's pawing, if you ignore that and because they, you know, whatever reason they're pawing they're, and if you respond to that and you're giving them attention, that behavior will increase. But if you walk away and don't give them attention, then that behavior hopefully over time will decrease. If you add bad things or give bad things, that's punishment. So positive punishment would be, you know, hitting a horse, a crop, something like that. So I don't want to get too bogged down it, but just remember that positive reinforcement increases behavior, <coughs> negative reinforcement increases behavior, and positive punishment decreases behavior. We use that a lot. And there's, you know, pros and cons to all of it. I'm going to try to make an argument for using positive reinforcement more than anything else, and that has stumbling blocks a lot of times, but um, we'll talk a little bit more about why that's good and bad. Does anyone have any questions? 
<laughs> All right, so thinking about, let's, I'm going to use the example of a horse that doesn't like to get an injection because I think that's one of the really common ones. So um, if we're going to approach this problem, I think we need to take a few steps back and think about the problem because typically, hopefully, your horse doesn't need an injection as an emergency. Sometimes that happens and we need to get an injection in to deal with a specific emergency and we'll talk about the pros and cons of that. But if it's something that's elective and something that's not absolutely mandatory, then hopefully we have time to kind of think about the problem and address it. Um, so practice makes perfect, you know, certainly practicing that interaction ahead of time and working on it. Being calm really, really helps because horses, I think more than any other species are very in tune with our energy level and how anxious we are about a situation um, and being very patient. Um, I think also being honest is really important. When I was in practice, there were a lot of calls I went to where my predecessors unfortunately had done the like, well, we kind of walk them around the corner and then, you know, jump out and you just give them a shot before you know you're there. Yeah. Or, or having to like jump over something and do it really quickly or covering the eyes so they can't see what's going on or trying to hide things behind your back. Um, it doesn't wait. You may get away with it a couple times. Certainly I tried <laughs> on a few occasions when I was really desperate. But over time, it's not going to work. It's not really going to help our horses um, see it as a positive experience. Um, the other is paying attention, and that's a safety thing. You know, just being aware of where everybody is, what the horse is doing. Horses are very large animals, and it can be dangerous sometimes to work with a horse that's panicking or doesn't want to be um, handled. Um, and ultimately, you can have all the best answers, but your horse is going to tell you if what you're doing is working. So if their behavior is not improving, it may not be the method per se that you're using, but it may be your timing or something that's going on. So you need to look at your horse, watch their behavior, see what they're doing. Um, there's a good article recently by Sue McDonald. Um, oh, I apologize. I don't, it was, I don't think the link is on here. Um, she had a great article on safe horse handling for vet visits. Um, and talks a lot about setting the stage for success. So having your horse on a lead shank, not on cross ties, um, you know, not just holding their halter or something like that. That's very dangerous. Um, having a reward handy. Um, usually that's a highly palatable small treat in a bucket, something like little that's where they won't fill up really quickly. Um, but it could be something else. If something else is rewarding to your horse, maybe scratches on the neck, um, anything that they, they seem to find rewarding. Usually treats that work the best. Um, being dressed properly is going to make you more confident. Wearing a helmet is, is always a good idea. Um, you know, having the proper shoes, everything you need, that's going to make you feel a little bit more secure. Having some prop items like syringes and things like that to practice with. And then working in a large enclosure with good footing, like if it's nice weather out on the grass or somewhere where these people are in the picture, not in a, you know, an IOA or a stall or somewhere where you're kind of confined and stuck in there. Um, and a calm area where there's not a lot of foot traffic, there's not a lot of people talking on the phone, there's not a lot of stuff going on. Um, and you can do this alone. It's, it's helpful to have an assistant, but you can um, hold the, you know, the lead shank and do the rewards. It, it just can be a little bit tricky, um, but it is possible to work alone if you need to um, when you're just getting started. And so Sue McDonald talks about what, you, what your goal should be for teaching your horse. Um, they should learn that the procedure leads to a reward, that it's not too painful, because actually I think in reality, most of the time, the actual needle poke itself is not that unpleasant for the horse. It's just the anticipation of everything that happens around it. Um, and that you'll kind of continue if there's mild avoidance. So not this is not for the horse that rears up or is really, really reactive, but if a horse kind of gently moves away, just kind of stay calm and stay and stay with it and teach them that that alone is not going to stop it. Um, but you don't want to, that's not the point where you're like going to, you know, put a twitch on and sort of say, we're getting this done no matter what. It's sort of just teaching them that if they turn away, it doesn't necessarily stop the procedure, but you don't want to push it too far. And then you just start behavior modification. So behavior modification is different for every horse. It depends on their specific trigger. So for some horses, it might be the vet just pulling up in the driveway. Um, for some horses, it might be the presence of the syringe. For some, it might be standing next to their neck, ready to give the shot. So you have to identify that specific 
um, spot that your horse starts to object. And that's when watching your horse is really helpful and seeing their behavior change. When do they start to put their ears back or tense or, or notice that something's going to happen? For some horses, it might be really severe and obvious. And for some horses, they might tolerate up to a point. So you, got, you have to watch them carefully. Um, and then define the target behavior. What do you want your horse to do? You want your horse to stand there most likely and not rear up or back away. Um, but, you know, make sure in your mind you have an idea of what you want them to do. And then for the behavior modification, you basically, if they do the behavior, you can say good or you can use a clicker and then you immediately give a reward like in the picture where she's giving. It helps to, I, I think it's nice to have one of those little grain buckets and kind of hold it so that you're not handing them treats. Um, and the one thing to remember with horses too is not to reward them when they're um, mugging you and like all over you and pestering you for food. Always give them uh, the treats sort of when they're facing forward or slightly away from you so that they get rewarded for standing like that. Um, and so basically you just repeat that and you just sort of every time they learn that they're standing four feet on the ground, you say good, you give a reward, wherever you decide to start that target behavior. Um, you can calmly write out mild resistance, always staying as calm as you can, and you want to work for about 10 to 15 minutes. And it typically takes about 10 repetitions before you move on. So if it's just the presence of the syringe, you take the syringe out. If they stand, good, treat, move on. Do that 10 times and then move on to putting, you know, a hand on the neck. So break down the entire procedure into steps and work through each one up until the point of injecting or at least putting the needle cap on the neck. I think the hardest part of all of this is that it's really hard to recreate a vet visit every time because, you know, you've got to have a really patient vet that comes by. You know, with dogs and cats, we do like happy vet visits, especially with dogs where they go to the clinic every week. And I think it's really hard to find a vet who has the time to come by your house like every week and pretend to give an injection. But you can practice this at home um, and, or, you know, at, on your own and then, you know, have them work with, the, with your horse as well. Um, it really, it really doesn't take as long as I think people realize. Um, but if you see extreme avoidance behavior, rearing, all those kinds of things, then you want to work on an alternate behavior. Like instead of just saying no or getting upset, you say, okay, what can we have our horse do that is not going to be rearing up? Okay, it might be backing up and putting their head down. So you're just going to reward that for a while and teach them that that's going to get them a reward. Um, some of the pitfalls and mistakes um, is to reward too many times without a contingency. So if that means that you want your horse to get rewarded every time they're doing the behavior. You might get excited and be like, good job, I'm just going to give them lots of food and I'm so excited. You don't want to do that because it can be confusing for the horse. Um, likewise, you want to not talk too much. You don't want to continually say, good job, good. You know, some people try to sort of so I, for me, sometimes I feel like I'm doing it to calm myself down, but if you continually talk the whole time, it's really confusing for a horse. They don't know what, the, what they're doing right. Um, and so you want the good to be a marker of what they were doing and not say anything else in any other way. Um, you don't want to, like I said before, hide what you're doing um, or sort of vary or abbreviate things and just decide, okay, that was going well. Now I can kind of get a hand over and just quickly get done what I need to get done. Um, you can use restraint. Um, like a neck twitch or something like that. And that goes to the, the picture here that talks about building trust accounts. You know, sometimes we have things we absolutely need to get done for our horse's health. And so that sometimes we borrow from that account. We might, you know, restrain or, or use um, chemical sedation. Chemical sedation for me is preferred, but you might do something that's not the best practice, but it's getting you where you need to go. Um, I think understanding that that's not always your first course of action, that you're going to try to do something that's positive first, and then, you know, you might have to um, do something more aggressive if needed. Um, another thing is sedation itself. Um, horses learn best without sedation, but I'm also a big believer in safety and, and decreasing their stress. So, like, if it's something that has to get done and you're, either your vet sedates or you do an oral sedation ahead of time, I think that's okay, you know, better living through chemistry. But the, if the ultimate goal is to be able to do routine things, I think that it's better to do it without because they're not going to remember. If you're, they're sedated, they're going to be more compliant, but they're not going to learn and they're not going to remember what, what you want them to. Um, so uh, basically, you want to make the right behavior easier. So you want to set the stage for success. You want to remember the behavior is an action, not a label, and you want to make the right behavior rewarding. Um, I think it's much easier to control the environment rather than the animal. And um, 
it's also amazing sometimes to see how quickly horses learn and how quickly they respond to, to positive behavior, so, or positive rewarding their good behavior. Uh, let's see, I think that's everything I have to say. I said <laughs> All right. okay. So uh, five of you were nice enough to send in history forms and Dr. Anderson uh, tried to address the vet phobias, although one of them was really easy to solve because you knew exactly what started the horse off and that was green coveralls. So she just has to come and get some green coveralls to wear around her horse so the horse is desensitized to that. Unfortunately, it's usually the vet trunk that the horse is recognized. So that has to be a little harder to deal with. So either the uh, Cornell ambulatory should change the color of their coveralls or she should get some green ones of her own. Um, another problem was um, one that perhaps with this brain trust here, you can help me because this uh, lady has a Missouri fox trotter, only he doesn't like to do the fox trot. <laughs> um, now, I don't know much about gated horses. I, my first horse was actually uh, an American saddlebred. And to make him rack, you just had to uh, pull up his head and squeeze or kick him and he would go into that gate. But I don't know what the usual signal is for the fox trotter. Does anybody, was it your horse who was doing that? No. Yes. It's my horse. It's your horse, thank you. <laughs> and it's just, I use the word trot, but he takes that to mean Gallop. gate. No, he, he gates very nicely when he wants to. So, but what well, a fox trot, oh yeah, fox trot. He does the fox trot. I ask him to trot, or I just squeeze a little bit with my legs, and when he want, feels like it, he'll do it. But when he doesn't, you imply that he sort of ran away. He, yeah, he almost never wants to do it. So <laughs> he pulls the reins out of my hands. He pull, puts his head down very abruptly and runs. And it's a very fast trot and it's very uncomfortable. And he um, runs at a trot. He so. runs, I guess it's a trot. I'm not even, I can't even identify it. Yeah, he <laughs> runs, a, he does a fast trot. And I'm too old to fall off. It's really scary. Um, yeah, I don't have any idea what to do. Though the last time I rode him, I gave him peppermints after every time he trot, he gated. Uh -huh. And, and he, well, at first he loves the sound of the peppermint being unwrapped. Okay. And then he couldn't wait to try it again. But that was two times ago. That, that was two rides ago. The last time I rode him, which was over the weekend, one of the days it didn't rain, <laughs> he did the same. I didn't even ask him to gate because I could feel that he wasn't about to. And I didn't want to get into a fight. So we did different things at a walk. So I can tell when he will, and I can tell when he, when he won't. And I don't know what to do when he does it, since I reward all of the times he does it correctly. So I'm at a loss and I can't ignore it because it's dangerous. Certainly if he's running away. It's, yeah, it's very dangerous. So I turn his, high, his hips. I pull up on the inside rein a hard and I stop him. But I don't want to keep doing that, but I don't have any other ideas. Well, I, except for my own horse, I've never dealt with gated horses. So perhaps you can find a, a trainer. But the first thing is let's make sure there isn't a medical reason why he doesn't want to do it. If that gait is more uncomfortable for him than just walking or trotting, uh, then you can do some. That, I mean, of course, you should have someone come and examine your horse. You can sort of find out by giving them some fusilladin before well, you ride. We did all of that? You did that. We Good. did, and a chiropractor. Well, I don't believe really <coughs> in chiropractors. <but laughs> and on a lunge line, he's fine. 
He will do it on lunch line? Yeah, although he will break into that fast trot, but I think that's just training. I mean, he needs to be reminded. I mean, he can trot, he can do a diagonal trot, he can do five different gates, but only when he feels I, like it. So don't how do you him. use the clicker? I use a clicker. No, how do you use a clicker? With my tongue. Oh, you just clock. Okay. That's you always have that with you, so that's good. Oh, yes. except when I clock it means my horse to go faster. Are you sure? Well, it's a difference. I make a different sound. Okay. It's a different. So you you make that sound and then what? He stopped on a dime because he knows that behavior was what I wanted. He stops when I click. Oh, he stops the game. He stops whatever behavior he's doing. Oh, that's not good. Well, that's what I kind of want him to do. I want him to stop. I want him to stop the behavior so he knows what he just did was correct. And then it might confuse him. Well, that's how I was. That is how I was taught when I had a trainer that the behavior is what I'm reinforcing that particular behavior. When he does what I like, I click and treat him. Well, first place, if he stops and then you click, then no, you I click him first. When he's doing the behavior. Well, I can't want. very well treat him when he's gating. Right, right. Or that's, cantering. That's the problem with that, although I was saying that someone did invent a bit that you could squeeze a bulb in your hand and it would deliver sugar into their mouth. <laughs> so that, that would work. Uh, the, and you said peppermints as, you know, you click and then it has to be followed by something good. Immediately, right. Yeah. Well, the peppermints are the jackpot. Okay. They're hard to open in the summer, almost impossible. <laughs> well, I don't think they're going to have summer this year. So they're right. <laughs> they're very sticky. Um, so my take home message for all behavior problems is many of them can be solved if they get nothing but hay and the, if you treat their ulcers. So many of our horses, especially if you have performance horses, have ulcers. And that can make a big difference. I know when I have a pain in my stomach, I'm not very good company either. Um, so that can eliminate a lot of the the behavior problems that, that one is having. So he might have, might still have some um, pain that he only experiences when he's doing this, or it could just be you know, a training problem, but you can help you with that. So we had the two horses that did like vets, and we had that horse, and what was the other one? Um, oh, the rearing horse, okay. Um, is the rearing horse owner here? Okay, um, that's very dangerous, of course. And um, so you, you can do simple things like sometimes just having a standing martingale on the horse so that he can't get his head up will help. If the horse does start to rear, what should you do? Lean forward. Lean forward, yes. Um, put your arms around the horse's neck. What you don't want to do is to pull back. Um, so um, again, you have to make sure that the that horse isn't in pain. Often that can be associated with tooth problems. Um, so a dental exam would be a good idea. And sometimes these horses are much better if they have a bitless bridle instead of um, something knocking against their teeth. Um, if you're really good, you leap off the horse when he rears and then you leap back on again. But even when I was you know, 25, I couldn't do that. So much less <laughs> now. Um, so, and what was, what was the fifth problem? The one that I didn't have a copy of? Oh, it was the one that was the vaccines. Well, did anyone else send in the history form that we haven't talked about? For the problem we haven't talked about. Okay. Uh, do you have other behavior problems that we could deal with, at least in a superficial way? Mm -hmm. Yes. What about um, a horse that really doesn't want to be haltered? 
just. Um, there, there are a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, it raises the head, turns the head away, uh, acts like it wants to bite you Ooh. a little bit, you know. Yeah. So, what's the best way to get a, a horse to uh, accept do what you want, you know? Right. <laughs> and that's pretty common thing. What you Usually what they don't want is something scraping over their ears. A lot of horses are very sensitive about their ears. So sometimes um, if it's a problem with bridling, if you take the bridle apart and um, undo the cheek straps so that you can put the, the um, pole piece over his head without pulling on his ears, and then you buckle the, the cheek straps onto the rest of the bridle. So that can help. Uh, it's often good to work with the horse on a hot day when they like to be scratched. Uh, so they won't mind having your hands around his head. And you can do the desensitization to that just as you do to, to uh, needles. So you sit in the stall and you have a bucket with a little bit of food in it. And when he puts his uh, nose in the bucket, um, you can, he has to put his head through the halter to get his nose into the bucket. Um, and then you take the bucket away and you do that again and again without fastening the halter until he's used to putting his nose through the um, nose piece uh, without anything attacking him from his pole. And for some reason, the pole seems to be what bothers most horses. Um, it's just repetition, basically, there. So, that, so he gets a reward for um, having the halter put on. So um, I have a pony who has to be tied up because he's dominant over the horse and who is, you know, twice his size. And, but the horse needs more food. And, of course, as a pony, he needs less food. So every meal I have to tie him up. And, um, of course, he would rather be stealing the food. And but he has learned very quickly that if I have if I come, I've got something for him. I have a carrot or something like that. Equine senior, which apparently is is like opium for horses. They really, really like it. Did you find that with donkeys? The only thing they would take is equine senior. So now he's fine, except if there are two people present. If there are two people present, he knows something is going to happen. Like he's going to get an injection or something. Oh, so, he was fine with me and my husband. Though. Hmm? He was fine with me and my husband both present, but I think because he knew we were both feeding him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so um, and I have. Does anyone have a horse they can't catch? I got this really flashy um, paint Arab cross, and when I went to try her out, she was in a stall, and I rode around. She was fine. Then I discovered why she was in a stall, because if she was in a paddock, she <laughs> ran away from you. Unfortunately, she wasn't very smart. And so uh, if, if I were in my riding clothes, she would run away. But if I was dressed like this, she wouldn't. So I'd come home from work, go out, catch the horse with grain, tie her up, run in, put on my jeans, and come back and ride. So that worked pretty well for that problem. Um, the other one was aggression towards the numbers. Oh, okay. Oh, what did you find? One of the things you can do with nippy horses is to train them to look the other way um, so that they, you could use a, a, a clicker for that, um, where the horse will only get a treat if it looks to its right as you come up on the left. Um, and you can also train the horse to do something else that's incompatible with running towards you, and that's backing up. And uh, many horses are pretty easy to teach to back up because if you press on their shoulders, they usually will take a step back. And as soon as they take a step back, you say back as they're doing that, and then you can give them a treat. And if you have enough hands, you could use a clicker as soon as they take a step back, then you click and then give them a treat. And they will only get their grain if they back up. So you can teach the horse to back up to the back of his stall when you come in instead of greeting you with his ears back and his teeth out. And that seems to work pretty well. 
Now, you can also give horses uh, supplements. I mean, most people, I think, spend an awful lot of money on supplements. But there's one that seems to be good for training horses. Uh, and that's Xylokine, which you can get online. And it's just milk protein. Uh, you know, to have a glass of warm milk before you go to bed. Uh, milk protein is casozapine. It's sort of related to Valium-like drug. Uh, and that's worth trying on some of these horses because uh, it won't hurt him. Uh, and I, so far, haven't heard of any horses that got worse with that. And then if, you know, with more serious problems, we certainly use medication. Um, I've used um, Prozac, generic Prozac on horses, um, and some other older drugs can be used. So you can take advantage of you know, veterinary uh, pharmacology to, to make your horse more um, to your liking. So how are we doing for time? About 15 minutes. Did you have the other one? Yeah, you can do that. So, other questions, problems? Yes. We have a pony that is a perfect walk trot, does everything. She's super sweet, but as soon as you ask her for the canter, bolting, she doesn't buck much, but she just goes into a straight bolt around the arena, head up, you neck out. Martingale might help. And we've tried like bits, we've done the dentist a few times. She has like really good teeth. Good. We've done chiropractors. And we've tried, tried a few supplements, right? Like we've, we've tried Mayor Magic. And you tried what? Mayor Magic. Like just like a that? raspberry leaf. Like raspberry, because we don't know. She's hormonal. Oh. <laughs> um, she gets into really like large heats too. But just any time of the year, even when she's not in heat, she'll just throw her head up and bolt. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, as soon as you bring her down to a walk, she's not worked up, she just starts, she's all relaxed again. It's just as soon as you ask her for the canter, she bolts. Hmm. And, and are you working on the ring or are you on the trail? We're in the ring. Okay. We've taken her out in the trails and to the canter, she bolts too. Well, we said when, we, when we're on the trail, she'll still bolt too and we ask for a canter. It's even more scary. <laughs> Does she do it on the lunge? She's, yeah, she runs on the lunge too. And Dr. LaPointe looked at her and he said, There's nothing physically wrong with this horse whatsoever. So that's what, and every trainer says, Oh, I can fix that. No, no trainer can. She's taken her in for training and she hasn't improved much either. Oh, well, um, you know, you can see whether little Xylokine will calm her down um, or what. The other dietary thing that often helps is adding fat to their diet. Uh, seems to help, you know, fewer carbs and more fat. Um, and I, what kind of a bit is she wearing? She's currently using a French link, but we've tried snaffles. Um, we've used Kimberwicks for like a harsher, but and we've also used vouchers and tried to go softer. That's what we've done in Mullen Mouth and a and bitless. Bitless, forget about it. She really yeah, is harder. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that um, sometimes helps is to lean forward and grab, you know, I guess you're the oldest child. <laughs> um, None and of the pull, other kids will ever pull her <laughs> hand in so that she uh, they are unlikely to keep galloping if they can't see where they're going. Yeah, where well, it stops. To get her to stop. She generally, she's at the point where she just rides it. We just ride around for five minutes. She's still galloping around. Which scares the living daylights out of <laughs> And she, and she doesn't, she's not balanced. she catch, she doesn't, like she said, she's not balanced. So she'll stumble and almost fall over oh. around the corner. So it's like, okay, get back up. Let's keep doing A new pony might be a good idea. <laughs> 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 She's not too big yet. <laughs> and you know, lunging her for 20 minutes at a dead gallop, she'll probably be a lot better then. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think I don't have much.
time if that's at all do i this point you have 10 minutes okay yeah. well so let's So what is this horse? What's this horse? Moon. Disregard the birds and his mate. I can't really see his ears. So. Pardon? I can't see his ears very well. It looks like he's squinting. I think he's asleep. Right. Yeah, asleep. Asleep. Yeah. Hang in. Yeah. So that's um, you're right, you can't see the ears, but his eyes are closed, his nostrils are relaxed, his head is probably down. So this is a horse stand resting or even going into slow wave sleep. Then these are my favorite ones of the three of these horses uh, are very relaxed, and you can tell that because their upper lip is long. Um, one is rubbing against a tree. This horse on the lower right is being scratched on the withers. Um, and um, this the horse on the upper left is also rubbing his rump on the fence. So those are all pleasurable things. So what is the expression of the horse in the lower left? Alert. 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 This is, this is an Arabian waiting to do something scary. <laughs> waiting to shy at something. Mm -hmm. He's waiting to shy at something. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Talking to them helps a lot. Okay, what about this horse? So, can't see her ears, but what do you think her emotion is? I do. <laughs> like to bite me. Her mouth is open, her teeth are showing. Um, look at her um, nostrils, they are really uh, pinched shut. Of uh, wrinkles, uh, her tail, see her tail is flashing and she's showing her teeth. Now she either does not like my suit or she is heavily pregnant and doesn't want to be touched because her abdomen is very sensitive. How many of you have seen this, the snapping behavior? Uh, that actually has many names. Uh, Snapping and implies aggression, but it seems to be much more often when the foal and it's a foal of behavior is in an ambivalent situation. In this case, the mare and foal have been separated, and the mare was very agitated, you know, jumping up and down and neighing and so on. And the foal was a little scared of her, but also he was upset that he was separated, so he rushes up to her doing this facial expression that I translate saying, I'm just a baby horse, don't hurt me. You're apt to see it when foals try to play with an adult horse or whenever they've been frightened, they will show this. And if a young horse shows this facial expression, he's not socially mature and may be beaten up by other horses. Yeah. And this is just, uh, an alert horse with ears forward, relaxed um, nostrils, and he's standing erect. And tails are important. There they are. So here's a, actually a scared horse. So if, if your horse is aggressive, uh, try to determine whether he's aggressive lashing his tail or aggressive tucking his tail in because the uh, lashing tail means uh, that he is aroused and aggressive, um, but the tuck tail means he's afraid. Um, the, let's see if I can see it. This one is interesting uh, because, let's see, yeah. where the horse mm -hmm. Dorsey flexes his tail, so the hair seems to be falling straight down. That horse doesn't know what he's going to do. So if you see a horse running around you with his tail like that, be careful because he might run towards you or he might run away from you. Uh, the very aroused horse uh, has his tail straight up. You'll see them doing that in play. And of course, that's what they want Arabians to do in the show ring so that they look like they're high spirited. So if your horse isn't that high spirited, you put a little ginger into his anus and he will hold his tail up 
which may or may not be a welfare, I mean, certainly cheating, but whether it's a welfare issue or not, I don't know. Uh, the horses don't seem to get an increased heart rate when you do that. Um, and it probably is because the ginger warms him under his tail, and so he raises his tail to cool himself. Uh, but as I said, it's still cheating. Um, and then the top one, where's where that come from? Um, the horse that's just uh, lashing his tail is the, the one who um, is aggressive or at least irritated. So looking at the tail, whether it's clamped or lashing is up or whether it's dorsi flat is something you should do. How many of you have seen this, the arched neck fret? And this is something a stallion does, especially when he sees another stallion. It's the beginning of a horse fight. Um, but a common problem presented to me is a gelding who thinks he's a stallion, and he may do this when you come in to try to get your mares out of, quote, his pasture. So be aware of that as a threat from a horse. Okay, so here is a mare. What do you think her mood is? Annoyed. <laughs> Annoyed. Annoyed. Well, probably ambivalent, at least, uh, with one year forward and one year back. That's not her foal. Um, and she had just been added to the pasture. The foal was so glad to see someone besides his mother, he rushed off to try to play with her. And fortunately, she was not aggressive. But that is the ambivalent horse. I mean, essentially, he's listening in front and he's listening behind. He's not quite sure where the danger is coming from. Um, so. And of course, they do things with their legs, they strike with their forelimb, or they paw, um, and they can threaten you with their hind leg. Here's an old picture of a horse pawing, and it's made with impatience, and that is often the situation where horses will paw. Um, so if you have a horse that paws uh, when you come down the aisle to feed him, should you feed him first or last? Last one. Mm -hmm. Aha, I should have known. I'm in New England where everyone is very puritanical. No, you should feed him first. And the reason is that he has learned that he has to, to paw 300 times before you feed him. And so if he gets the food first, he's not going to practice so many times. You can get a rat to press a bar a thousand times for one pellet of food. And the longer we wait to feed horses, uh, the more likely they are to keep repeating a behavior, whether it is making a noise, you know, hitting the feed bucket against the wall or pawing or kicking the back of the stall. So those horses should be fed first so that they don't have time to develop this very high ratio of his actions to the reward, which happens to be his question. So what if there is, it's not about food at all? They're just doing it to make noise. <laughs> what okay. would you do in that situation? <laughs> Sometimes putting them on wooden stalls mm -hmm. uh, okay. floor so they can walk around and get the same noise. Um, gotcha. uh, we have played music for horses to see if that helps. Of course, uh, he's probably in a stall. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So Besides feeding a horse nothing but hay, the way to cure almost all behavior problems is put a horse out on pasture where he uh, isn't confined at all and he has other uh, compatible horses. I don't really want him to be beaten up by other horses, but uh, many of those problems. Stall vices don't occur outside the stall. Yeah. A yeah. <laughs> uh, question online was, um, should you work to feed when not acting up? So should you try to feed when? Yes, you try to catch the horse doing the right thing. Yes, and, and that's why the quicker you get the food to them, the less likely they are to have to run to kick the stall. Of course, they may be kicking the stall uh, because they hate the horse next door, and sometimes just rearranging the horses can get rid of that problem. I have a question. Yeah. What kind of behaviors do you see come out of horses that weren't raised or spent a lot of time within a herd? That's 
many of the really strange behaviors that I see are by horses that were weaned and then isolated. So from you know, four to six months, uh, they were taken away from their mother and put in a stall by themselves. And those horses are often very difficult both to handle and, and also difficult with other horses because they miss their uh, socialization with other horses. If at any point you can rejoin them within a herd, is that tricky because they haven't learned how to interact and or would that help resolve some of those issues? It, it might. Uh, some of these horses you can't put with other horses because they're, they're very aggressive and don't know what, what to do. Sometimes what happens is that you can keep horses next to each other for a while and then you know, may take a month or two, and then you may carefully try putting them together and see what happens. So, mixing horses is always a problem, and people have tried various things, you know, introducing them across the fence. Sounds like a good idea, and I would do it, but it doesn't seem to decrease the amount of aggression. The only thing that seems to help is uh, if you have one horse that you want to add to three horses, take one of those three out and put it with the new horse. And there'll be some aggression between that horse and the new one. Um, then after a week or so, you can put both those horses into the herd and they'll, again, there'll be some aggression, but it seems to decrease the severity of the aggression if you do it that way. For the life of the horse, do you find it's in their better well-being to, if you are lucky enough to have the right combination <coughs> of a small herd that they can be with them for, Forever. for a long period of time? Yeah, is that? Like horse heaven there? Yes, probably they, horse heaven. Yeah. I mean, okay. if, if you look at feral horses, you know they now pay you to take a Mustang? Mm. <laughs> so if you want a feral horse, you can have one. <laughs> um, I think you still have to have eight foot fences, so no. it's a little difficult. Anyway, um, so what was your question I got sidetracked? Just that if, if, if you had that, so like we are looking at, we're at the point where we're not with horses, now we lost our horse, our last horse a couple years ago. Oh. And so if we were able to get to the point where we could have, you know, a horse for myself, my husband and my son that got along well together, like for the, for the long, for the long term, we're long term relationship with people. Um, is it generally in the horses? Interest to be, yes, because what would happen, that's what I was saying, what happens to yeah. feral horses that the, uh, they're born into a span, and the males leave, usually when they're about two years old. Uh, and the fillies will leave either then or maybe a little bit later, and they're often driven out by their father. Uh, and then the males will be in a bachelor herd for a couple of years, and then they'll finally acquire a band of their own. The fillies, when they leave, are picked up by another stallion and they will remain together uh, for the rest of their lives. The stallions come and go. Stallions usually only have mares for about five years, but the mares, if undisturbed, will stay together. So. The last question? Pardon? Somebody else? I, I have a question. Do you have any advice on, you know, Probably many of us have small farms or whatever, a few horses, and then you have that nice Saturday afternoon to go ride by yourself. But your horse is very hard to separate from the other. Oh, horses. that's yes, I know that problem well. Right. I have that problem. <laughs> Two horses is not a good idea. <laughs> um, although my pony doesn't really mind if the horse leaves, but the horse really does not like to go. leaving. Mm -hmm. um, so, my solution is teaching my horse a very bad habit. I let her graze. Each field, she gets to have 20 bites. <laughs> 20 bites. And it has worked, really. It has worked. Really? Well, so then she wasn't quite as much of a barn rat on the way back. Right, right. So, so again, you know, making it, I suppose, if, if, it, if there weren't grass, um, you could have a few strategically placed buckets with a treat in it that she That's could right. know she gets. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I hate riding with people that their horses graze, but it worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> Something along that line with me, my horse, he'll go so slow out on the trail, and then once you turn right around, he's like, go to go. It's called being a barn rat. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. it's very, very common. You know, the only thing I can suggest is 
ride very quickly away so the horse is a little tired. What about a mare that doesn't like to be in the barn by herself? Well, I don't think many horses want to be by themselves. So um, you can try a mirror. Even a poster sometimes works. Um, if, if you have other horses outside the barn, your window so that you can see them, being able to see another horse helps. And it really seems to make a difference if they can touch another horse. So if you have one of these beautiful stalls that, that has a you know, screening between the stalls, that prevents tactile um, interactions. And so you really get rid of that so that you can touch. Others. If you have no other horses, well, that's not too much you can do except the artificial things, the mirrors, the poster of horse, and so on. I was surprised that a, a picture of a horse will help calm a horse, but it does. I had heard of that and didn't yeah. think that she would accept that, but I haven't tried it yet. Yeah, try it. This is a, a situation oh, no. where we need to bring her into the barn just like to tack her up. Oh, okay. Normally she's with other horses, but bringing her into the barn, even if there are other horses around, but not in the barn, barn. she's like oh. a different creature. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's where maybe you, you should try one of the over-the-counter calming agents to see if that doesn't help. Um, and of course, you can make coming in the barn the best thing that ever happened to her. That's the only time that she gets something. So there is a chance of conditioning it out of her? Possibly, yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes um, it, you can try to do it gradually. You bring another horse in. And of course, it takes two people at least to do this. So you bring another horse in, and then you have that horse farther and farther away from her. And the big thing is when she can't see the other horse, she'll probably get more agitated. But if you do it gradually, and choice gets rewarded from coming into the barn, you have a fighting chance of decreasing that behavior. You know, it's, it's natural behavior. Right, uh, right. If she were separated from her, the uh, uh, mountain lions would get her. <laughs> I was riding in California and we were um, supposed to, it was called the Mustang ride, where there'd been a drought and you had to ride and ride before you were lucky enough to see the tail of the Mustang. But they had no overpopulation problems as they have in many other places. And the reason is that they had mountain lions and the mountain lions killed most of the foals. And when we came down the mountain to the valley, there were more feral horses and there were foals all over the place. But I'm afraid the BLM didn't think it was a good idea to put a lot of, well, I suggested pit bulls, but put a lot of mountain lions out to solve the problem of the wild horse overpopulation. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. If you had to choose, where was your favorite place you've ever ridden? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, ha, ha, ha. Well, I rode in the Imperial Palace with the man who just stepped down as emperor. Oh my God. We were in horse shows together, but he always won. That was Japan. <laughs> was that Japan? Japan, yeah. Oh okay. my God. Um, I, I, you know, riding, um, I went on a lot of equitours. I went to India that way, um, and Ireland, which is very pleasant. Um, so it would be really hard. Um, Egypt, rode around the pyramids. I went on a tour there just before the Arab Spring. I was probably the last person to do that. Um, and so you ride from pyramid to pyramid and so on. That was pretty nice. Um, so there are lots of places um, to go. Um, in Israel, I rode a, a horse around the wadis of, of Jerusalem. And this was on a horse was owned by another veterinarian. And he had bought this mare from the Bedouins, and when he bought the horse, they said, now we get the first filly that she has. And he said, sure, of course, they can build them. Well, the filly foal was about two weeks old when they knocked on his door and said, we are coming to get our foal in six months or so. <laughs> so, so that was pretty nice. <laughs> wow. Um, then in Australia, that was, it was one of these, you know, riding vacations where they really want you to help do things, <laughs> and they're the, Problem is that you're, you know, I'm used to turkeys flying up in my face, but not kangaroos. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a <laughs> mm -hmm. well, more questions, more. Okay, I'll stay as long as you have questions. You've been a great mm -hmm. audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.